I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. Great friend and philosopher and writer, Ryan Holiday. We talk about his brand new book, The Daily Dad, 366 Meditations on Parenting, Love, and Raising Great Kids. What I will have to say about this book, though, is it's not for parents. It's really about how you communicate to all the people important in your, in your life, including, by the way, people you might not even know. Like many of you listeners, I am so grateful for, but I don't necessarily know you personally. And each one of these pages, there's 366 stories about modern stories about stoicism. And when I say modern, it's about characters and people, real people that you know about and love and follow and so on. And it's all about how do you communicate to the people you care about and how you learn about yourself through that communication. Plus, I get Ryan to talk at the end about how he markets all this, how he took this ancient philosophy and made it modern through his sheer skill in marketing, which is, you know, his first book, Trust Me, I'm Lying, was about marketing. And since then, I think almost every one of Ryan's books has written a, a whole bunch of books about philosophy and stoicism. He's come on the podcast for each one of them. Every time, so many great new stories. This is probably the most personal we've got was on this podcast. So I hope you enjoy. And here's Ryan Holiday once again. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. I was supposed to be doing this in the studio, but uh, no, I like that you're doing uh, it in the bookstore. Like, I am curious, like, because you kind of curate every book in the bookstore, right? Yeah, the idea is that it's only books that I like. So, tell me some of the ones in the background. I see some Robert Greene there. Oh, well, the, yes, these are these are not bookstore books, not all of them, but uh, let me see. You know, Mike Duncan, he has the, no, I don't. Uh, History of Rome podcast. Okay, he wrote a biography of Lafayette, which is really good. This is a biography of Rickover, uh, Hyman Rickover, that I thought was really interesting. This is the Taylor Branch series on Martin Luther King that's really good. Queen Elizabeth was a big character in Discipline, so there's one, two, three. There's like five or six on her. Queen Elizabeth the second or the first? The second. The late Queen Elizabeth. Well, I guess they're both the late at this yes. point, but um, yes, yes. The, uh, the, the Let recent me ask you one. a question. You have um, Hyman Rick over there. Yes. and. 
obviously Hyman Rickover was a big influence on Jimmy Carter. In 1976, Carter's campaign biography was called Are You the Best? Yes. Which was a quote from Hyman Rickover saying to him, are you the best? And Jimmy Carter said, no. I think you wrote about this. I, I think I told this story this. last time I was on the podcast, which is one of my favorite stories of all time. And so, but my, my confusion about that story is Jimmy Carter thought about it and said, I wasn't the best. Yes. And Hyman Rickover walked out. Yes. Now, we know the conclusion of the story, which is that, you know, Rickover did bring Carter onto his submarine and, and was a huge influence and mentor to Carter. But why did he walk out and why did he then hire okay. uh, Carter? So, so important distinction. The question was not, are you the best? What he said was, he, he said, Oh, did you try your best? Yes, he said, how did you stand in your class at the Naval Academy? And uh, Carter sort of very conceitedly or proudly said, you know, I was 89 out of a class of 500 or 600 or whatever it was. And then Rickover says, but did you always do your best? And so Carter thinks about it and he wants to answer, yes, of course. And then he stops himself and he thinks about it and he goes, no, I didn't always do my best. He, he thought about, um, you know, times that he didn't try as hard as he could have, times that maybe he could have done extra credit that he didn't do, times he didn't push himself physically, books he could have read that he didn't read. And so for him, the answer wasn't that he wasn't the best. It was that he, had, he hadn't always tried his best. And so when, when Rickover leaves, I don't think he's, he's not condemning Carter as worthless. I think what he's done is challenged him with this idea of, you know, it doesn't matter how you ultimately end up placing or, you know, your rankings. It doesn't matter that you win. Ultimately, the, the measure that you have to test yourself against was, did you give all that you could give? Did you do everything that you could? And that sort of question haunts him. It's funny, you could never title a campaign memoir, Why Not the Best, in 2023, not, not just because it's, it sounds a little conceited, but like it, there, the nuance there, he was saying, why not the best? I'm going to give my best. Uh, that's not what we, I, I don't know. There's an earnestness to that, that I feel like we don't think about today, or we don't expect from politicians, which is what's really incredible about Carter. Like, um, you know, post-presidency, I think he's indisputably uh, America's best ex-president, right? Like he's had the best post office term than anyone. And his term didn't go spectacularly, but it actually did have a bunch of great accomplishments in it. But there is something about Jimmy Carter that I think is different than all the other presidents in that he seems to be a human being first and a sort of a yeah. political figure second. He was, he was more both for, to his credit and to maybe many people's dismay, he was very introspective and honest about it. And yes. people would criticize him for that. <laughs> like yes. they, people always say, I don't want a regular politician. And then yes. Jimmy Carter sort of comes out of the blue. Like nobody knew who he was before that campaign began. He was, he was a, unlike most presidential campaigns, he was like a very unusual surprise. And yes. coming out post Watergate, people didn't want the usual politician. But then when he would say things like, I pray every day, Sometimes I have lust in my heart. Like there's all these quotes he has that yes. everyone's like, oh, shame. I don't want a president like this. Yeah. And you have to wonder, like, you know, to some extent, I view him as very stoic in the sense that, like you said, he didn't have the best presidency. Yeah. And I don't know if he ever admitted that or not, but as a post-president, he was sort of incredible. And, you know, by the way, ironically, Nixon was probably a better post-president than he was a president. Yes. Well, well, it's hard for Nixon because Nixon was such a bad president or such a bad yeah. person in office. It was sort of nowhere to go but up. But I, the other interesting thing about Carter is a lot, a lot of our view of him now is a reflection of how screwed up our views were then. So I'll give you an example. Um, Carter gives his famous speech, his, his moral equivalent of war speech, which um, he was basically saying, look, we are hopelessly dependent on foreign oil. And this makes us weak from a foreign policy perspective. It makes us beholden to corrupt regimes with terrible human rights uh, records. And it's just not scientifically or environmentally sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. So he gives this speech and more, the moral equivalent of war is a phrase from a, a very famous William James essay about how war is terrible 
but it brings out some of the heroic great attributes of human beings, you know, uh, courage and sacrifice and selflessness. And he was saying what, what human beings need are causes that are like wars, but are not destructive like wars to throw ourselves into. And what Jimmy Carter gives his speech and he's saying, we need to have the moral equivalent of a war against our dependency on oil. And so he puts uh, solar panels on the roof of the White House. Uh, he turns down the thermostat, et cetera. And um, th this, uh, this speech gets known as his meow speech, M-E-W, moral, M E O W, moral equivalent of war, right? So we're making fun of him. The first thing that uh, Reagan does when he's elected is rip the solar panels off of the White House, right? And in retrospect, Carter was not like a little bit forward thinking. He was a hundred percent right. And if we had solved our dependency on foreign oil or made significant investments in these things in the 1970s, we might live in a completely different planet, a completely different political environment. And so a lot of a lot of the reputation that Carter gets is not just totally fair, unfair. It says a lot more about us than it does about him. No, I agree. He kind of um, shed a light. And I don't mean to make this a podcast about Jimmy Carter. I want to get to your, yes. to your excellent book. But he kind of uh, was like a mirror where yes. people kept saying, oh, we need a different type of politics, a different type of politician. We had Nixon, we had LBJ, Vietnam, you know, we had all these, and, and by the way, LBJ, I know, you know, you know, he, you, you've written a lot about LBJ. You've also talked about Robert Caro, uh, his main biographer, but you know, LBJ had a lot of flaws as well as doing some good things as president and same with Nixon, same with, and then, and then we're saying we want a different sort of politics. Jimmy Carter comes in and now he's basically ranked the worst president in the past century. Not, yeah. not, and there's no meaning to ranking. Like they're all horrible, yeah. I think, but he somehow stands out for some reason, maybe because he wouldn't, maybe because we are aware that he was introspective as opposed to like everybody who came afterwards who almost seem impenetrable. Like we don't know what they really think about their own presidency. Whereas Carter was just sort of like down, not necessarily down on himself, but he just constantly was questioning himself. Well, I'll give you, I'll give you another one. We, we say we don't want politicians. We want leaders, right? And uh, Carter, the, his first day in office, Carter <laughs> pardons all the draft dodgers and people who fled to Canada to escape serving in uh, Vietnam. And he said, look, the nation needs to heal. He, he says, like, it, it, this is just what we have to do to move on. And you could argue that, so this is, this is a politically unpopular decision. It's as politically unpopular as Ford pardoning Nixon. And every single one of Carter's advisors said, do not do this. It will sink your reelection bid and definitely don't do it in the first, in your first day in office. And he was like, nope, it's the right thing to do. I'm going to do it now. And the, one of his advisors said the surest way to get to Jimmy, Car to get Jimmy Carter to do something was to tell him that it was bad politically. He would immediately see it as a thing that you should do um, because he didn't want to make political decisions. And so part of the reason we see Carter as an ineffectual president is the fact that he loses reelection. He, he almost certainly loses reelection because of some corrupt and screwed up things that Reagan does as far as the uh, the negotiation of the release of the right. hostages from Iran. And actually, a, a guy in Texas just came through. He's like in his 90s. He was like, no, no, no. I was part of that trip. I I did it on Reagan's behalf. So it's it's probably a historical certainty. But the, the point is, part of the reason that we don't see Carter as a great president is that he didn't win re-election. But the reason he didn't re win re-election was to go back to where we started. He was doing what he thought was best. He was doing his best. And he wasn't thinking a lot about politics. He wasn't thinking a lot about image. And I think there's a tension there. I, I'm, I'm writing about this in the the book that I'm doing now, um, you know, is that something we should celebrate in Jimmy Carter? Or did he lack a certain political savviness or pragmatism that would have allowed him to continue to be a decent human being in the office for another four years? 
you know, I, I think you could argue it either way. Yeah, I think I think that's one of those questions where both answers are true. For instance, you know, it's not necessarily bad to be to appear bad. <laughs> like yes. we we perceive him now as a as a bad president, whether he was or not. Uh, I would argue zero presidents have been that effective. Sure, and, it, it's a know, job you're set up to fail in. Right, and and we're just we can talk about him as a failure because there isn't like a lot of people arguing on his side. Yes. You know, Clinton came along and I think Democrats were relieved that, okay, this guy does appear to be more of a leader than Carter. And he did win election twice. He had a lot of problems, obviously, but somehow he came through them. And by the year 2000, he was very popular despite having been impeached and so on. And Carter just, he just sort of never, he just was always, he was like a stock that was always just ticking down every day and never came back. It's a tension between competence and goodness in the world. And I think that like a larger point could be made. A lot of people, we mentioned Robert Greene, Robert Greene talks about like, look, the people who are good and decent are the ones who need to understand like the laws of power and the way uh, media works and marketing works. Um, because so often they think that just being right or just doing the right thing is enough to win. And unfortunately, reality is a lot more complicated, right? Like you have to, um, you have to be savvy and you have to be strategic. And I think you see a lot of companies, organizations, causes, uh, you know, leaders fail because they're just like, I'm right. That's enough. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Maine dress shirt you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, Shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like, I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured, 
for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. Jimmy Carter wasn't that great a storyteller in the political sense. And yes. Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, W, Donald Trump, all these people were really good storytellers. Whether you could say the stories were true or not is another thing. You know, yes. the premise of a story about make America great again, which is, by the way, a Reagan slogan that Trump took. Yes. People don't even know what that means. When was America better before than it is this moment is unclear. Nobody ever answers that question. No, I had never even heard anyone ask that question. And, yes. but that's not a story that, that Jimmy Carter was, was willing to tell and talk about because it felt manipulative. And I think people don't realize it. And I know they don't realize it. People like to be manipulated. They like to be put, put in the hand. Like you look at television shows about the presidency. The president is against all odds. Something bad's happening, you know, on some fictional story. And then he finally decides to be honest with the American public. And that's what makes him more popular than ever. So Americans view themselves as appreciating honesty, but it just doesn't happen in reality. And I'm not, I shouldn't say Americans, everybody around the world. No, look, I think politics are, are kind of a loaded context to view this in. It's hard for people to see it, but I'll, I'll give you a, an example, like in writing. Um, I am fascinated by ancient philosophy, right? And I would read and regularly do read very long, very boring books about ancient philosophy. And I would love to live in a world where everyone else was on the same page as me, but they are not. And so how do you find a way to get people, it's not even that people want to be manipulated. It's that people have uh, biases, they have prejudices, and they are resistant, right? Um, like we all are. So how do you find a way to deliver ideas or advice or Im important truths in a way that doesn't go head to head with that resistance? How do you find a way to make people interested in uh, and captivated by things that they are not inclined to be interested and captivated in? I'll give you an example. With Ego is the Enemy, um, I wanted to write a book about humility. That's what I was first thinking about doing. And I read a bunch of books about humility. I thought about the topic a lot. I tried to talk to people about it. And I found that that was just not the entry point. It was not compelling. And so ultimately, I did write a book about the power of humility, but that book is called Ego is the Enemy. Because by attacking ego, I'm making a positive case for humility. But if I celebrate humility, actually, I bump right up into people's egos. And so uh, what a lot of creative people have to do and uh, you know, marketing people have to do, political operatives, et cetera, is you have to find the way into an idea or a story or an, uh, a concept. And it's not just, oh, this is important. Oh, this is correct. Oh, I'm excited about this. There's more artistry and deafness required there. Well, it's interesting because classically, you need an enemy to make a story compelling. So, Often, yes. And, and you talk about this in, in your book, The Daily Dad, that it's not about telling people, listen, you need to be more humble. It's you need to set an example. It, I think a big theme in your book or one of the big themes in, in The Daily Dad, which is such a powerful book, by the way, as Thanks. a father, I could say this, but even if you're not a father, for instance, if you're a mother, um, you talk so much about setting an example of how you personally deal 
with hardship or the potential hardships in your life without necessarily telling the kids, hey, life is hard. This is what you do. Or you better do this or else life's going to be horrible for you. Like this was always something very important to me as a parent was I had a lot of problems as my kids were growing up, but I, I would never let them obviously see specifically what the problems were. I just let them see what I was doing to solve these problems. And I think this is my one saving grace as a parent, because in other ways, I don't think I was that great, but, uh, your, your book was a painful book for me to read actually, because it just made me think so much about my, my own, you know, 24 years experience now as a, as a father. And, you know, every, there's nobody who's a great parent, just like there's, it's hard to be the worst sure. or the best at anything. And have a lot of people told you that like this, this book is sort of bittersweet to them as they read it. No, that's, that's really interesting. I haven't thought about that. I mean, your kids are obviously older, so some of the ship has sailed, but, but there are probably things that I think every parent wishes they did differently. I, it is funny though, actually to go to what we're talking about, it's like hard to get people to, to read stuff. I went to my publisher in 2019, maybe even, maybe even 2018. I don't remember exactly, but I had the idea for the daily debt and I had sold a, a good chunk of books, you know, a million plus books of my other books at this point, maybe, maybe a, a few more. I'd hit bestseller lists. I had a good track record. I deliver books timely. And I, I went to the publisher and I said, look, this is what I want to do for my next book. And my publisher, who you know, Adrian, uh, he said, parenting books don't sell. We're not interested. <laughs> Even though I'd done five or six books with them at this point, they basically passed on the project. And so I said, okay, fine, I'm going to do it anyway, but I'm going to do it differently. I went and I built this email list around it. I built a social following around it. I, I, I basically wrote the book online for free before I made the book. I learned a bunch of stuff, uh, but basically I figured out what the themes were by doing it. But the point was my publisher was under the impression that because most parenting books don't sell, this one wouldn't sell. And it's true. Most parenting books don't sell because parents are really, really busy. And most parenting books are not very good. They're not very actually conducive to the life of a parent. I think they're either very much written for women or they are very patronizing and condescending to dudes. And so I had to figure out how to get through not just the reservations of the potential reader, but also the reservations of my own publisher. When it came back around, they, they, you know, we worked out a good deal on it. How did you convince him that this would be something worth trying? Uh, I guess because the publishing industry today sort of revolves around the numbers of social media platforms. Mm -hmm. So if you demonstrate that, look, I set up a different social media presence in some sense, even though it was still Ryan Holiday, I set up a different social media presence. Here are the results. That kind of directly translates into what kind of advance uh, a publisher yeah. will give. I mean, uh, I, I built a big email list that delivers the Daily Dad email every single day that has you know almost 100,000 people all over the world. Uh, I built a big social media following. I made videos about it. Also, the Daily Stoic went probably sold another million copies between now and then. So I, I had a bit more leverage uh, and a bit more credibility with the publisher. But also, uh, you know, I took less money for this than I would have taken for a different book. I, I know it's going to work. I know it's going to do well I because I, I, I have evidence in myself at this point. But again, just because you're excited about something, just because you think it's important, doesn't mean it's going to work. You have to figure out where the audience is, what they need, not what they say they need or what they say they want, but, but what they actually need and what they're actually going to be interested in. And that's a lot of work. And I think a lot of people, you know, they just trust their gut, let's say, and that's not a good instinct. That's not verifiable enough or quantifiable enough. No, but you make a good point, which is very important lesson for writing, speech making, for any kind of communication, basically. You have your set of interests, right? Yeah. So you were interested in doing a book on parenting. You were interested in doing a book on humility and, and on and on. And you refer to this in, in The Daily Dad, that the best, most effective way to communicate is through story. So yeah. basically you're kind of like in your own internal world where you love it. Like, oh, I love thinking about parenting and I love thinking about ancient Greek philosophy. And that's just your little island that you live on. Yes. And then you have to build kind of a bridge or a way 
to reach out to people who live in their islands. And totally. story is the only way to do that. People don't realize there is no other way. Story yes. is the only way to do it. And you basically refer to the most popular bestseller in history, which is the Bible. And you basically say Jesus rarely told people what to do. He told parables and stories. Like the main character of this best-selling book was yes. the best storyteller in history, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, a, a great example, right? Jesus doesn't go, okay, fathers, if you have a kid, you should be very forgiving of them and patient with them. And if they go astray and come back to you, um, you should definitely, you know, forgive them and accept them back into your heart and into your home, right? No, he, he doesn't say that at all. What he does is he tells a story about the prodigal son that illustrates this. It's like the greatest... Uh, most uh, universal writing rule is that you show, you don't tell, right? And that's what Jesus says. He shows the virtue that he wants parents to embody. He shows them what that looks like in the form of a story, as opposed to a lecture or a pronouncement or a commandment or whatever. And, um, you know, even <laughs> Abraham Lincoln is a great example of this. He would illustrate his points through stories, through anecdotes, you know, through through funny little yarns. And that, that's basically what the book is. It's 366 little stories, uh, each one illustrating like a slightly different way of thinking about parenting. That's basically what all my books are as I focus on stories. But it's a very powerful technique. And I, I think you've obviously been, been mentored by, but I have like enormous respect for Robert Greene, who's like the master of this. I mean, he has so many stories in his books. Like reading one of his books, you feel like your IQ is rising per page. Um, well, it's like, like reading like 50 different books. Yeah, it's amazing. Like even the footnotes have like three page stories in them. Yes. And, you know, it's it's just phenomenal how he does it. But you do it very well in a way that's super appetizing. Like, oh, I didn't know this about some, you know, Lou Gehrig in your last book. Or, you know, you have so many just, you know, stories in this book, like you say, it's 366 mini stories. And, and it does each one again, does make me think about my own role as a parent and, and parenting. And by the way, you said, oh, they're older. The, the ship has, has passed. The ship never passes by the way. Yes. <laughs> like you're always their parent, and they always need you. Now you have store a story of somebody who, um, it was, uh, Sandra, Sandra Day O'Connor's husband who moved to Arizona to be supposedly to be with Sandra Day O'Connor, but he kind of was just honest and said, nah, I really just wanted to get, get away from, get my, away mom. from my mom. Yeah. Yeah. And this is an interesting challenge as an older parent, which is that you want to make sure as a younger parent and you, and you point this out that they're going to still want to be, the kids are still going to want to be around you and call you and check in when they're older. And that's a very important aspect of parenting, which continues into their twenties, thirties, and so on. You always have to be a good parent. There's, there's never, people say, oh, I'll, it's empty nest now. My job is done. And, and it's just like you tell the story of Mitch Hurwitz, the, the creator of Arrested Development, where Pete Holmes congratulates him that he did it. The kids are out, they're safe, they're alive. And it's like, no, that's doesn't work that way. And it really well, I, doesn't. Like I spoke to both my kids yesterday and you know, they, they are, they are always going through things and you have to be the kind of stoic philosopher in their lives that say, yeah, I went through things too. And it's hard. But, but I think that's a sign that you were a successful parent, that they are still coming and talking to you. It's either a sign that you were a terrible parent and you have a, a screwed up codependent, uh, uh, relationship. They never left the house, or it's a sign that you absolutely crushed it and you know they still want you in their life. I saw Noah Kagan did this interview with the founder of Kinkos. I'm forgetting his name, uh, but he, he uh, Noah sort of asked him what it's like to be rich or something like that. And he said, you know what rich is? He's like, rich is your kids coming home for the holidays. He was like, how many people have lots of money and they never see their kids? And I, and I, I, I really took heart in that because uh, it struck me that yeah, when you when you look at whether you succeeded as a parent or not, you're really not going to be like, oh, I succeeded because they went to Harvard or, oh, I succeeded because they make $300,000 a year or I succeeded because they had children of their own. You're going to 
you're going to be thinking about if you're lucky enough to say live to your 70s are you still having thanksgiving together as a family are you invited are they flying home it, is is it actually a fun family experience or is is everyone walking on eggshells and it's tense as hell you know success is going to be is your family when when it is no longer financially and um figuratively dependent on each other is there still the voluntarily the <coughs> the voluntary time together the connection the bonds etc that's what success is going to be and yet and i and i think m- almost everyone would concede to that and yet when you think about what we do as parents day to day what we measure what we argue about what we harp on it's never things that are contributing to that it's almost invariably things that are probably making that less likely in the future right i mean you i don't think anywhere in your book the the daily dad do you say you know convince your kids to be uh you know to be a republican or a democrat or and yeah. argue with them until until they agree <laughs> like yes. that is just but and yet that's what happens in so many households and, and and look we all have opinions and we all want our kids to share our opinions but often i have to kind of stop myself and say you know what i argued just like this when i was a kid with my dad and rather than just having a good conversation my dad and i would sometimes argue to the to the death of this issue and i'm just not going to do that i'm not going to have an opinion on this there, there's this great quote from marcus aurelius where he says remember you always have the power of no opinion that he's like he says things are not being he said things are not asking to be judged by you right and to me that is such an incredible bit of parenting advice because i think about the fights that i've had with my parents as a kid i think about some of the things that uh frustrate me to this day i think about things that i hear about in other families and you're just like why do they care that you got a tattoo why do they care what color you dyed your hair that obviously there's a difference between caring about these things when your kid is 11 and when your kid is 26 but you know you hear about parents fighting with their children about their college major or you 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 hear about them you know uh, disowning their kid because of their sexuality and you're just like why do you have an opinion about this at all i remember this is I'll, I'll share something that i think is both illustrated but not it's personal but not super personal my my sister's husband is uh a vegetarian right now my parents paid for they, they had a small wedding my parents paid for for like the reception or something like that right and um they wanted to have a vegetarian uh reception they didn't want to serve meat on it and my dad had really strong opinions about this and there was arguments about it and i remember my dad afterwards going you know i really didn't think this was a good idea but it worked out okay of course it fucking worked out okay what why have a fucking opinion at all about food that someone else serves at a wedding right all you're doing is creating a source of tension that is going to get between you and the person that you say having a relationship with is the most important thing in the world right and so i think that the road that human beings go down and parents go down to their de- to their detriment is you just have too many opinions about things that do not matter in the big scheme of things at all yeah and 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 it's interesting because the the different topics that you focus on in the daily dad and again for anyone reading this whether you're a dad or not or a stoic or not or whatever or a mom or not it doesn't matter. These stories are are great and universal. I I found myself I was bookmarking every page, and I said oh, I can't do that because if you book, you know, if you're if every page is is worth bookmarking, you don't need to bookmark any of them. <laughs> but well, just to be clear, it's called the Daily Dad because I am a dad, right? As opposed to it is for dads, and I felt I felt weird. I, there was something that didn't feel right about the Daily Parent, but that's really what the book is. So right. So, but, but the things I think one should have opinions on is what you focus on in the book. Like for instance, you know, teaching your kids to be grateful or, or raising a reader yeah. is one of your chapters. You're a reader and obviously reading has benefited you so much. You want other people might disagree with you, who knows, but you want your kids to be 
a reader. Yes. Help them become who they are. Don't neglect yourself. Character is fate. Put your family first. You know, these are all opinions you have that you want to share with your, your kids, but they're broad opinions about character and being a better person and not necessarily like, okay, let's talk tonight about defunding the police. <laughs> like we need yes. part of being a parent is forcing my kids to defund the police or whatever the latest opinion in the world is. This is such a valuable service for all business owners, big businesses, small businesses, doesn't matter. I wish I had this in the many different businesses that I've started. Sometimes it seems like your business is humming, but then suddenly you don't understand it. You're starting to fall behind. You're not understanding what where your costs are, where your revenues are, where, where your payments are. Teams are buried in all sorts of like BS work and you can't seem to close the books. So you need like one dashboard, one source of truth. I'm jealous of this business, NetSuite from Oracle, of course, NetSuite by Oracle. I wish I'd come up with this idea. It's, it's, it's a brilliant concept to have all your business intelligence on one dashboard. This is why you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. So 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators, your KPIs, in one efficient system with one source of truth manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. So right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash James. That's netsuite.com slash James to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash James. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing. In some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn, but People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. 
boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. You know, we were talking about Jimmy Carter before. Where do you think you have not been your best? Where do you think you have not tried your oh, best? I, I mean, we, we could spend the next like two hours on this, but are you mean specifically as a parent, where have I not been my best? No, I mean, we could talk about specifically as a parent, but I just want to know in general. Well, I would, I would probably say there, like, I, obviously, are, are, is there things I could do better professionally, you know, as a citizen or something? Sure. I'm sure there are. I don't, I don't wake up that often and go, and feel, I don't feel guilt about that, I guess is what I'm saying. So I, I would say that most of the things when I look and I go, I could have done better, I, I, I need to do better, uh, that wasn't who I wanted to be. It's almost invariably parenting stuff. And I would say that the couple of buckets or themes or failings that I find myself repeating are usually, it's usually like I'm, I'm not being with my kids when I'm with my kids, right? So like I'm not being present. I, I, I was thinking um, uh, the other day, like a, a way to express this is like the secret to being a great parent is giving your kids presents, um, but, but the other kind of presents, not gifts, but actually being present, like giving them all of yourself when you are with them, not thinking about other things, not checking the clock, not uh, getting distracted on your phone, not trying to speed things along, but like entering their world and being fully in it. I think that's something I really, really struggle with. It, it's hard because you're consumed by your interests and you're, you're always writing a book. So that's always top of mind. You know, you, now I, in an ideal world, kids and family are always top of mind, but when you're writing a book, you, sometimes you have to make that top yes. of mind. And even when you're not typing on a keyboard, you're still working on, on the book and thinking about it. You know, it's, it's, it's a hard thing, which again, I think is why it's bittersweet to read the book because I always think about times when I wasn't fully present and I'm, I'm heartened though, by the story, like you have a story of, of Jerry Seinfeld in here where he talks about, it's not about quality time. Sometimes it's about garbage time. Like just, yeah. just putting in the time and spending time with your kids is, is important. People always talk about quality time. Well, sometimes you might not have opportunity to have quality time, but you can always still, you don't have to full, be fully present is, a little bit what he's saying is that it's okay to just be with them. And, and there's, it reminds me of speaking of Seinfeld and being a comedian, Al Franken wrote a book. I forget which one it was where he talks about the time he spent with his dad, that at the best times when they were just watching TV and not talking yes. with each other, yes. that it wasn't quality time. It was quantity time. And there's a little bit of both of that. Like sometimes you want to be like, okay, I'm going to take my kids on a safari to Africa and teach them everything. And other times it's just like, Hey, Let's just watch TV together or take this ride with me to the supermarket or whatever. I, I was thinking about this recently. It's almost like there's some there, there's almost like a cop out quality to um, quality time, right? Because you're like, I'm planning this big trip. I'm spending this money on this big trip. And you're like, um, you're like congratulating yourself. You're distracted by it. It's in the future. Um, you think that you're 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 special. You're a great parent for doing it. And meanwhile, what you're neglecting is the fact that you're sitting next to them on the couch. You're driving to school together. You forget that also the drive to the airport and the flight is part of the experience. But you're actually you're so looking forward to that or you're so anxious or worried or stressed out during that, that you lose it, which is probably the other thing that, uh, I guess this is not great having written these books about stoicism, but I, I struggle with sort of two emotional issues. One is temper and two is anxiety. And they usually are related to each other. I get stressed because I get angry because I'm anxious. My anger is making me anxious about something. But but I, I would say like, I've never 
been glad afterwards that I lost my temper, particularly anything related to my kids. And then 99% of the things I've been stressed about, anxious about, you know, high strung about, like 99% of them have never happened. We've never yeah. missed a flight. We've always had the money we needed for stuff. Like all the things that I'm like, it's got to be this way or everything will fall apart. Like that has served me well 0% of the time. I think that's a good exercise actually to kind of map out all the things you were not glad about afterwards. So yes. Like I've never been glad after I was angry. Yeah. Um, I've never been happy. I was anxious about X, Y, or Z. I'm an anxious person. And one of my daughters, not both, but one of my daughters is, has a lot of anxiety and to the point where she'll be crying. Like, what if this happens? What if this happens? And I always tell her to write it down every time. Cause it's, it's like a, a pattern. Yes. Like I always tell her, write it down exactly what you're anxious about. And then we could see later what your ability to predict the future is. Yes. And cause I know from my own experience, it's going to essentially be zero. Yes. But you know, again, once you have kids, there's a lot of like, did you want to have kids? How many kids do you have now? We have two kids. And did you want to have kids? I, I didn't not want to have kids, but I was nervous and scared to have kids. And I, I probably put it off longer than I should have or would have if I was doing it again, if that makes sense. I was, yeah. I, I was worried, particularly from my relationship with my parents, that I was worried that I didn't have the emotional range, the energy, the time, or like the, the, whatever the magical ingredient is to be good at it. I, I, I think I doubted myself. Um, and so I, I was intimidated by the prospect of it. Yeah. I think similar for me, I, I specifically did not want to have kids in part because of what you just said, but also because when they're born, now a new life is unleashed and you yes. look back at your own life, all the times maybe where you've been unhappy and I just didn't want them to go through that. Mm -hmm. And that was one big reason I was just not happy at the thought of having kids. I didn't want to put another entity through sure. that pain of being human. If that's, it sounds almost weirdly egotistical when I say it now, because they wouldn't have been human if they were born. But, uh, you know, that was my feeling. I totally get that. And then, and then the funny thing is then you have kids and it switches, right? You go, oh my God, this, this thing is happier, sweeter, more innocent, more earnest, all of these things. And then you go, my job is to not corrupt this thing, right? Like, um, have you read the road? Yeah, of course. You know, he says like, are the carrying the fire. I feel like your job is to help your kids care. You, your job is to carry the fire, to not let your kids, to not put it out in your kids, to not extinguish it or be so cynical or negative or whatever, or anxious or, or mean or, you know, busy or whatever, that that thing, that goodness and sweetness and earnestness that they're born with, like your job is to help ferry that to adulthood. You know, it's interesting you bring up the road as a, as a, I never thought about it. The, the road is a Cormac McCarthy's maybe most accessible book. It's a story yeah. about a father and son post-apocalypse, uh, you know, post the world having some sort of disaster and everything sort of wild, like, like Mad Max kind of wild. And, but it actually is a book about parenting. Like totally he, he's firm. He doesn't, he doesn't yell at his kid. He doesn't get angry, but he's firm when he, he needs the kid to understand something. And yet he's also trying to protect the kid a little bit from the horror that's, that's around them. And well, no, I, we, were, we were talking about politics earlier. That's the other one I, you know, the kid goes like, cause they have to do something. They have to steal something or they have to fight someone who's trying to steal from them. I forget exactly. But then afterwards they're sitting around the fire and the kid goes, are we still the good guys? Like, uh, and I think that's a question that as a parent, you have to think about is like, where are, are you the baddies, right? Are you the good guys? Or have you let your own interests or your own, you know, self-preservation instincts about your family, you know, like, are you, are you part of the good guys or not? Yeah. That's a, and uh, I remember him asking that question and it's hard to answer. We all, yeah. you know, again, what's good and what's bad. We all, uh, 
what's moral and what's not. That's that's a definition that's constantly shifting, which is why kids wonder. They're trying to figure it out. And it's hard to teach them that it's more ambiguous than than it seems. I thought of an example about that the other day. They're I live in this town in Texas and they're um, Tex uh, you know, the outskirts of Austin, like San Francisco and places in California, um, there's a housing shortage, right? And it's hard uh, to afford things. And so they wanted to build this sort of big apartment complex down the road. And uh, some of those units were going to be low income housing, right? It was all going to be affordable, but there's some were going to be low income housing. Now, um, most people, if you ask them, they'd be like, yeah, of course, everyone should have a place to live. No one, no family should be cramped. Kids deserve their own room. You know, if you, if you work 40 hours a week, you should be able to afford to keep a roof over your family's head, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then here you have all the nice people in town besieging the city council. How dare you build this near us? You know, blah, blah, blah. The, the, the essence of nimbyism is basically, I have mine. I care about my family. How dare you do anything for anyone else that would decrease or hurt my property values, right? And so <clears throat> the result was they didn't end up building that thing. And those people have to live somewhere and they live somewhere that's not as nice as they could live in this thing, right? And so, you know, obviously the road is about, you know, the terrible choices you would have to make if you were fighting for your children's literal survival. But I think as parents, we have to ask ourselves, you know, there's this great story and I forget who, who it was from, but they were saying that, you know, in the old days, if, uh, if, if you heard someone say, let's build a pool for our kids, right? They meant build a pool for the community, right? And today they mean build a pool in the backyard that no one else is allowed to use, right? And, and so, you know, it can be so easy as a parent and as a person in the world to think about protecting yours, pulling up the ladder behind you, so to speak, and how much are you thinking about how the decisions you make or the way that, you know, you protect your family, how are you thinking about the consequences or implications of that on other people and their families, particularly less fortunate families. Also, and 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 in the context of being a parent, what's the message you're sending to your kids? Yes, their kids are very simple, right? Yes, they're usually smarter than they th than we think, and they're dumber than we think. So yeah. they're looking at they they think in very black and white. They, kids' brains don't think in nuances. Yes, and so the message they might be getting is that the other is not good to live near me. Yes. Um, yes. As opposed to the much more nuanced thing, which is, oh, um, you know, there's a lot of nuances in that, in that argument. Sure. Uh, and where you come down on it. Like I can't judge those parents. I can't judge people on the opposite side of that. It, it's a very complicated issue, but kids will judge. Well, and, and you have this great story uh, or one page. It's, it's, I looked at this page in particular today because well, yesterday, because it was April 27th. So this is your April 27th page. All right, let's see what it is. You're the voice in their heads. Yes. And this is a very important concept. This is maybe the one concept I took into parenting. Like I always remembered when my dad was yelling at me and how disappointed I was in him later from that. Yeah. And I never wanted to yell at my kids, but sometimes they need to be told that something maybe wasn't wrong or wasn't appropriate. Yeah. And my method for doing that was to be calm and basically tell them I was disappointed in yeah. something they did. And here's the reason why. And that might be a story, the reason why. That turned out to be effective. So you can either make them cry by yelling at them until they cry, or you can make them cry when they see what they did in terms of your disappointment. Not that you want to make them cry, but that's also the way that they remember a lesson you think is important. They're going to remember the times they cried. I, I heard a really good test. I think I saw this on Instagram or something, but they were like, okay, you're a kid in your house, uh, you know, many years ago, and you hear the garage door opening downstairs, right? Your parents are home. What is the feeling that you get in your bones or in your stomach when you imagine that, right? Yeah, like that's a good one. So happy dad's home, mom's home. Awesome. Or is it Oh shit. Right. And, and 
I would say, sadly, often for me, the feeling was, oh, shit, right? I got to go do all this stuff. I got to go hide this stuff. You know, I got to I gotta mentally prepare for what's about to come. What stuff would you have to hide? <laughs> I just mean like, oh, I was... I, I was eating chips in the wrong room of the house. You know what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't like, uh, I gotta, I gotta hide this gun and this heroin. It was like, <laughs> it was, it was like stuff that again, in retrospect, you know, matters so little to my parents, but we were just, that was what we ended up talking. We ended up arguing about shit that didn't matter all the time. Right. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, thinking about how do you, when your kids think of you and your presence, when they think of you coming home, you know, are they happy or are they sad? And this isn't, oh, you got to be your kid's best friend. But it is, um, are most of your interactions with your kids positive and pleasant? Or are they authoritarian and negative and critical, right? And when I think about the times that my parents yelled at me, I don't think back and go, oh, they were so right. I just think, why were they such dicks? Like, I was a child, right? And if you, if you think about, like, you know your kids are wonderful, right? You know that they're inherently good and sweet and have potential um, and are doing their best. You know all these things. But then when you think about the tone that you talk to them, when you think about the tenor of your interactions, how obvious is that, that you think that? Would they, would they know that? I'm not sure that they would. Let me ask you this. Uh, on the opposite side, what are the things that were best about your parents when you were growing up? Mm. My parents, they afforded us all sorts of opportunities to do cool shit. We were always traveling. We were always going places. We were always doing things. It was a very active childhood. So um, I traveled. My parents saved money so we could go on cool trips. Like, like my dad was a police detective and my mom was a school principal. But I... Even if I had never, even the day I graduated high school, I never traveled again. I'd have seen a good chunk of the world and had a good sense of, you know, how the world operated from the experiences and things that we were exposed to. That was a huge gift that I feel very grateful for. Now, did they ever put any pressure on you to get good grades or go to the right school or major in this or? Were they upset when you dropped out of college? They were livid. I mean, I, our relationship had a lot of trouble recovering from how they handled that decision. And, uh, you know, in retrospect, if my parents had had very clear and articulated expectations, like, like almost the immigrant experience of you need to be a doctor or a lawyer or a whatever, that almost would have been more helpful. I think my parents... Um, not quite sure what I should do or what was what was possible. They just kind of compared me to other kids. And so for me to drop out of college was very hard for them to swallow because I was the only child of any of their friends who had done such a thing. Right. So they right. weren't able, they weren't able to see the decision in the context of me and what I wanted out of my life and what my talents were and how that might might or might not pan out i think it was i think it was a lot about them do you know what i mean like it was a lot about how this reflected on them and that's a really bad way to judge anything related to your kids is how it reflects upon you yeah and it's related to another um chapter in your book or you know i should say page in your book cuz every page is a different chapter and a different story, but it's do not get in the way of their primal inclinations. Yes. And I think this is a very important concept. Like, yes, you can expose them to who you are. Like, this is my favorite music. These are my favorite shows. This is something that happened to me that influenced me a lot as a kid, but they're going to have their own thing going on in their mind and their heart. And it's going to change quite a bit too. So if you, any influence you have on telling them like, no, you need to be this. It's just not going to work because yeah. a people's passions change throughout their life. So no matter what you tell them to do, maybe they'll want to do it for a split second, but that's the longest they'll want to do it for. And you know, you, you kind of have to, you kind of have to let them be wrong sometimes too, 
yes. wrong meaning, whether that's an objective wrong or a subjective wrong. Yeah, I um I heard a good a good way of thinking about this that that you're a gardener and not a carpenter. So your job is to to water and prune and provide resources for as opposed to construct and build. I'll give you an example. This is a minor one because my kids are pretty young, but um we tried baseball with my son, we tried soccer with my son, we tried a bunch of, of different outdoor activities, like different sports, and he has just not thrived in any of them. And so um, I took him to a jujitsu class and he is obsessed. Like he, he, he goes three days a week. It's all he talks about. It's the first time that anything lit up for him, right? And that is what you're looking for. You're looking for the things that light your kids up. And then your job is to facilitate, encourage, and uh, support them in that thing. Now, he's super into it now. I also have to come to terms with the fact that he could, it could stop doing it for him tomorrow. And then my job will be to help him find the next thing, not to bully or criticize him for being a quitter or whatever, because he decided to stop doing this thing that he did like. And by the way, all of these things, kids are almost a metaphor here because all of these things apply to all of your relationships. Yes. Your, whether your relationships with your spouse, relationships with employees, relationships with your friends or people, you don't know, readers, for instance, for you and, and for me sure. as well, people you don't know, but you, you can't, you know, if your employees want to move on and do something else. There's only so much you could kind of persuade them to not do that before yeah. they build resentment and not like you and so on. Like I always, you know, from my very first company, I always wanted my employees to eventually quit to do something better than what yes. they were doing for me, except for Jay, who's not allowed to quit at all. He's no, I, he I talk to, to my employees it. about this all the time. I go, what do you want to do with your life? Because working for me is probably not going to be something you do for the next 50 years. I'm not even going to be doing this in this form for 50 years. So what, where are you trying to go and how does our time together help you get there? Right? Like you're doing a tour of duty with me and I expect certain things from you out of that tour of duty, but you should expect certain things from me as far as setting you up to do and become that thing. And I am going to support you in that. I'm going to help you in that. That's, that's what we're doing here. And by the way, I think that's the best you could do. Yes. Like there's this whole question, nature versus nurture, how much effect you really have versus their peers. And by the way, at different ages, you're going to have minimal effect compared to their peers. At different ages, you're going to have maximum effect. Your financial situation is going to have a big effect. There's so many factors into being a good parent and understanding the kind of different roller coaster ride of it. Uh, let me ask you, like, this for me is probably the saddest moment of being a parent. I remember my, my kids were very young and my ex-wife and I had to tell our kids we were getting a divorce. You know, it was a kind of build up, and then we told them and my youngest started crying and she said, I don't want to be one of those kids. Meaning she had some impression of kids who were divorced, they were a little different maybe in her mind than, you know, other kids. And now suddenly she was in that category. Sure. And sometimes there's nothing you can say. Like there really, she was going to be one of those kids. And, you know, other than just saying, look, we're both here for you the same way we always were. And we love you very much. We're still your parents. Nothing's changing in that. But sometimes you just have to let them have their experience. Yeah. And there's nothing you can do, even if they're crying. Yeah, uh, there is this instinct because you care about them so much to never want them to suffer, never want them to feel pain, to want to take everything that is hurting them away from them. And obviously you would never inflict anything on them on purpose. And I imagine you did literally everything you possibly could to not get divorced first, right? Like, it's not like that yes. was your, your first option, but then life, you know, life is, I, I'm going through this right now. We're having, we're actually today, we're going to have to put our dog down. 
Um, this is a Sorry dog. That. Thank you. My wife and I have had this dog for 16 years. Uh, so it's been there the entirety of both of my kids' lives. And, you know, we're, we're having to navigate this difficult thing that's making us sad, but also make them sad. And, you know, my son, my son, who honestly, I did not think was that close to this dog. They've kind of had a not that great relationship. So it kind of came out, out of nowhere that he was so kind of broken up about it. But, um, you know, my first instinct uh, was like, it's okay. You don't need to be sad. Like, let me distract you from your emotion. And like, I was, I, it was like, it was upsetting to me to see him cry. It was more than crying, to bawl his eyes out at the thought of losing this dog. And then, you know, I kind of realized like, um, I have to let him do this. And in fact, my job here is to encourage him to do this, to not like, like, where do boys lose the ability to be in touch with their emotions, to feel sadness, um, to articulate how they're feeling? It's because when they were six years old and their dog was dying, their dad was telling them to to get over it. You know what I mean? Or their parents were hiding this experience from them. And so we've kind of, we, and again, this might sound weird from someone coming from Stoke philosophy, but we've, we've actually been talking to them about like, like, let it all out, dude. Like everything you're feeling is, is totally fine. And you're, there is no right or wrong in how you feel something like this. But I think that is very stoic in the sense that you can't sometimes you can't change the way people deal with things. They just have to sort of, you know, they have to experience their experience and not try to manipulate the experience. And, and I think that is very, a very stoic approach. I mean, you would know more than me, but that actually brings me to a question about you and stoicism, not from a philosophical point of view, but this changes gears a little bit. You're obviously an excellent marketer. You, 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 you start off as a marketer. Like your first book was about marketing and, and, and it was a great book, by the way, trust Thanks. me, I'm lying. Fantastic title, fantastic book. I wasn't even going to mention the title, but I decided to mention the title. <laughs> um, but you've taken again, this like ancient philosophy, which nobody even gave a shit about for centuries. And you really, I mean, there are lots of books about stoicism, but you really popularized it. And it's almost become like this modern religion. And, and you use what I've written about and called the spoken wheel approach, like stoicism's the wheel. And then you have many spokes, including books and videos and an email newsletter and so on. So how can someone, what do you do? What, what are the techniques you do to kind of build up your brand, which is significant? I mean, you were just on the daily show for Christ's sakes, like, you know, build up your brand, build up this idea that you've been popularizing. You know, I mentioned a few things, but just in general, what's your philosophy about it and, and how do you do it and how can other people do it? How can other people learn from what you're doing? Yeah, it's a, it's a weird thing. So I, I think this happens in investing too, where someone makes a bet or they go, in on something that they think is going to work. They have, they, you know, they're like, Hey, seems like it could work. They I mean, they think it has an upside of X, you know, they think the downside is minimal. So they make the bet. And then, you know, sometimes that works out and they look very smart. Sometimes that thing turns into a Facebook or a Google or an Uber, and they look much smarter than they actually were in that moment. Right. Right. And and the stuff with stoicism has started to verge into that territory, right? Like I was really interested in stoicism. It's the philosophy that's changed my life. I love talking about it. I love writing about it. But it's worth pointing out, like the Daily Stoic, which is the book that kicked a lot of that off, was like an idea I got from my agent. Uh, and I was skeptical about it, right? I was like, okay, I'll try it. And then I had the idea, I said, but you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to keep it going. I'm going to make a daily newsletter because I, I knew newsletters really were great. Um, and I never had, I didn't have a good reason to have made, uh, something daily or weekly before. And I thought, well, maybe I'll do the daily stoic email. And so I had this idea of doing that, uh, in 2016, it would have been preposterous if, 
in 2016, I said, look, by 2023, I'll have been on The Daily Show. These books will have sold uh, 6 million copies in 30 languages. Like, that would have been preposterous, right? I just had a sense that this philosophy was something that there was a lot of material in, that it was very tried and true, that I, it was something I was, I was deeply earnest and excited and interested in, and it was well suited to a bunch of different mediums. That, that those were that's a handful of the reasons I had some sense that it was worth putting time that, to to taking a turn in my life away from what I was doing, which was my marketing company, towards this. You know that that was why I made that decision. I could not have predicted millions of Instagram followers. You know, YouTube now. I think we just crossed seventy billion views on YouTube. I, I could not have predicted any of that. But but it's not you couldn't have predicted. But it's not random. You you well, like let's take YouTube as an example. Yeah. I have never really focused on building up a YouTube presence. Yeah, which is sometimes confusing to people. Like my podcast is so much bigger than YouTube, but people sometimes wonder if yeah. it's equivalent. What's advice to me? Like what did you do to build up your YouTube presence? Because you you are very particular and strategic about it. Well, I I do use the technique you talked earlier about the hub and spoke or whatever. What basically. I like writing about stoicism and I particularly like writing about it in book form. That's what I that's what gets me excited, that's what I am that most talented at in my view, that's what's most meaningful to me. But over the years I've come to understand that that is not where most people are and that is not the best entry point to pretty much anything, right? And so books were where I started and then I started the newsletter then I started an Instagram account where we'd post it. So the, the newsletter was one email a day. And then the Instagram was one photo a day. And then Twitter, one quote tweet a day. And then what I did was I brought on my team to say, okay, what are other mediums that we can make this same content in? We can take these ideas and reach people in. And YouTube was one I got serious about maybe four or five years ago and then got really serious uh, about in 2020 because there was so much time on my hands. The way I, I think about it is, what is stuff that I have written about or talked about that's resonated with people in these other mediums? And how do I translate that to get it to work in, let's say, YouTube? I kind of think one of the reasons I really doubled down on video was that social media also doubled down on video. So if I make a one-minute clip, I can post that on Instagram. I can post it on Twitter. I can post it on TikTok. I can post it on Facebook. I can post it on LinkedIn. And I can post it on YouTube. So for one minute of content creation, I have five or six different places, different algorithms, different audiences, different platforms that I can spread that content to. And so, yeah, we really invested in YouTube about three or four years ago and it's grown super fast in terms of these videos how often do you think about production value like oh let's get some additional footage other than me talking or i need to be talking really close to the camera as opposed to far from the camera like it seems like you've made some conscious decisions well what i i think about like first what is the easiest way to start right what's the easiest way to get started and the first the first thing we started with were you know podcasts or TV spots or press that I had done, right? So we cut all those up and posted them. The next thing was, what's audio? Like I can record audio and then we can mash that up against footage that's in the public domain. So it, it takes five minutes of my time to record a script and then I give that to a video editor and they make that. And that did okay. And then once each, each step of the way I was getting not just validated, but the audience was getting a little bit bigger. And then I said, okay, well, what's the, what's the easiest way to shoot stuff? And you know, a GoPro with a microphone will shoot in 4K, like what you watch the movie on, you know, um, a GoPro can shoot. So for 500 bucks, I got a really good GoPro and some, you know, like a tripod and stuff. And then I shot a lot of stuff myself. And then that did really well. And then I brought on a full-time person to shoot video. And then it's like, hey, if we get this really cool drone, we can add, you know, exciting B-roll. So so I basically just I'm I'm just always thinking how can we take what we're doing 
and make it a little bit better. So I start with something accessible and practical to see how it works. And then once it works, I'm just elevating it and elevating and elevating it. And then, you know, if you're getting 1% better every day or every week, you know, you get a lot better really quickly. That's very true. I, and uh, uh, so, you know, there's this book, Measure What Matters, I think it's by John Dora, the venture capitalist. What you've obviously, you obviously measure the success of the different things you're doing. What has worked the best? Like, let's say across YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, what do you do that you know, if I do this, because of the statistics that I've measured about all my content is gonna really work the best? Yeah, the, the two kinds of content that seem to work best are stories and lists. I think the highest performance video we've ever posted was me telling a story that Kurt Vonnegut tells about him and Joseph Heller. This story is the best. I've used and reused this story so many yeah. times, but go ahead, you tell the story. I wanna hear you tell the story. Basically, Kurt Vonnegut is with Joseph Heller. Kurt Vonnegut wrote Slaughterhouse-Five. Uh, Joseph Heller uh, wrote um, Catch-22. And they're at the house of this billionaire, which is a thing that happens when you're a writer. You get invited to fancy people's houses as like candy or as a status symbol. And so they're at this billionaire's house and Kurt Vonnegut is teasing Joseph Heller. And he says, you know, this guy made more money this week than your book will make in its entire lifespan. And Joseph Heller says, well, I have something he will never have. And, you know, Kurt Vonnegut says, what could that possibly be? And Joseph Heller says, I have enough. That's such a great story. It's such a great idea. It's such a perfect way of encapsulating the idea that there's two ways to be rich, right? There's the one who has a lot of stuff, and then there's the one who has enough, right? And in fact, actually, the Stoics say this, one definition of poverty is wanting more than you have. So anyways, I told that mm. story in, on Instagram uh, or TikTok, and you know, it did a couple million views. It just you know popped. And that kind of blew the accounts up in a, in a new way, but it also, it was... It was funny because that's also one of the most popular stories that I've ever written in one of my books. It's in Stillness is the Key. And so it was just a reminder, oh yeah, I tell stories for a living. I, I identify as an author of stories, but really what I do is I tell stories. And my job and what my team helps me with is find out how to translate each one of those stories appropriately to as many mediums as possible. And the crazy thing about YouTube and social has been, it's been two things. One, I've heard from a ton of people who told me that's how they discovered me, which is what you're always looking for as a creator is right. how do you reach new people? Uh, so people who didn't know who my work, didn't know my work before found me there and then they read the books, et cetera. And then the other, the other part in it, there's, it's a blessing and a curse, which is I now get recognized like a lot, pretty much any time I go out, I will get recognized. It doesn't matter where I was. I took my family. We had a tour of the White House uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it was like the Secret Service officer letting us into the White House was like, oh, I watch all your TikToks or whatever. You're like, whoa, okay, this is crazy. And so that happens all the time now, which is, which is like I said, good and bad. It's a little awkward. But the point is, what I'm interested in is how do I use new technologies and platforms to reach people that I wasn't previously reaching. Yeah, this is this is really great advice. It gives me a lot of food for thought. Obviously, I think you've been on the podcast for every single one of your books and then a few extra times even beyond that. Uh, we've had so many great discussions. Stories I've written about conversations we've had in private have also blown up for me. Like, likewise, you know, likewise. Likewise. The conversation we had about about jealousy we had over yes. dinner once uh, has been a very powerful story. I always appreciate you coming on the podcast, Ryan. It, you've been a great friend, a great guest, and 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 so on. Uh, look, the Daily Dad, very moving book, three hundred sixty six meditations on parenting, love, and raising great kids. I'll say it again: it's not just about kids. Kids are almost the metaphor, but it's about communication and 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 the stories you tell are each one a fascinating story, really eye-opening story. And even if you're telling a story I've heard before, you always tell in unique ways. And your advice about marketing, great. So once again, Ryan, thanks for coming on the podcast. I look forward to the next book because I know you'll come on again and I appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me, man. And I miss you. I feel like I haven't seen you in forever, but I'm, I'm glad. Um, one of the things that's great about podcasts is you end up having conversations at a length and at a depth with people 
that for whatever reason, I think men just don't tend to have for no reason, although we possibly should. It's very true, actually. Like I would say doing a podcast is the main way I socialize now. Yes. <laughs> so, and, and keep up with my friends. If you so. called me, we wouldn't spend an hour and 20 minutes on the phone. I'd be like, I got to get off this phone call and do stuff. But over a podcast, you're like, this is what it is. Yeah. Well, and I know today's going to be a big day for you. Um, again, I'm sorry you oh, have to put your, your dog down. So good luck. And and look, uh, hopefully we'll we'll get together in person sometime soon. I'll let you know next time I'm down there. When someone accidentally threw away the school play costumes. Oh, no. Replacements were shipped with FedEx. And with picture proof of delivery, everyone could focus on the perfect opening night. FedEx, where now meets next. For residential delivery only. Make room in your closet, because Clear the Rack is on at your Nordstrom Rack store. For a limited time, find incredible deals on Wear Now styles. We're talking the latest trends from your favorite brands, now on sale for even less at Nordstrom Rack. Take an extra 25% off red tag clearance throughout the store, including styles from Vince Camuto, Mark Fisher LTD, Stuart Weitzman, and more. All sales final. The best stuff goes fast, so shop this sale at Nordstrom Rack today. Please see nordstromrack.com or ask a store associate for details.